Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 292 for Monday, February 15th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. As usual, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Nipomo, California, as recently, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> That's true. Paul, I hey, had... Hey, dude, I got something for you. No, oh, no, no, hold on. This go is ahead. important. All right, go. Have you looked at your calendar lately? I, I look at it all the time. Yeah, I kind of live and die by my calendar. Yeah. And... Do you know what this Friday is? This Friday is our anniversary. That is correct. It is our anniversary. Yes, that's right. Happy anniversary day. Happy anniversary. That's right. Yeah, this would be our sixth anniversary on Friday, as my calendar what is, tells What do you me. give for a sixth anniversary? I don't know. I'll, I'll give you uh, two always be performings and one rock on. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> the Church of Gig Gab. I don't know. Church of Gig Gab. I don't know what you're supposed what, to give. <laughs> what was well, years ago? We had an episode that was titled "What Three Chords of the Truth." Three Chords and the Truth. It was about uh, it, we. I think it was what we titled the Tom Petty episode, right? Wasn't it? That's it. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah three Chords and the Truth. You have a crazy memory, man. I do have a crazy memory. It's not always the best thing because <laughs> I remember, I mean, it's helpful, like certainly for music and all of that. It's great for interpersonal interactions. It's not always great because I will remember <laughs> conversations that we had and then not you and I necessarily, but you know, with people and it's like, Oh, that little casual interaction we had three months ago where I set my calendar by that. You have no memory of that at all. And that's not unreasonable. It turns out <laughs> like, yeah. Someone's like the burden of having perfect pitch, right? Uh, yeah. I don't suffer that. I'm a jackass about pitch, but not, but only relatively not, not perfectly. When, when you're hearing something and, and other people aren't hearing things, oh. it, it makes you crazy. Yes. Yeah. That's it. It makes you crazy. And often thinking, makes them crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I was thinking about, you know, we started, we have an ongoing thread that works its way into a lot of the episodes that we do that is kind of the continuum of amateur to weekend warrior to semi-professional professional. And I was thinking about um, how uh, I understand so much more now. Like, you know, when I started, I was like, well, you're not doing anything else. Why wouldn't you want to take a gig and, and do this type of stuff? But there are several guys in my band who their instrument is in their hands teaching all day long. Right. And, you know, their time at night is precious to them. And, you know, I, but I didn't understand at the time what that's like. And, and similarly, those little things that they would pause in rehearsals, like if you hear something that's not right, I think on the amateur, you're like, oh, I hear it too, but we'll, we'll let it go and I'll fix it next time or I'll fix it between songs or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, people with really tuned ears are like, no, I, I can't. I can't exist when these cacophonous waves are banging into each other, you know, and it's, it's not working. Yeah. You just, it, it really has been an amazing journey to kind of go from a guy who just picked up his guitar again, you know, his wife gave him a guitar and getting back into it to, you know, it being what I, you know, if you were to draw a map of my brain, it, it, it occupies an inordinate amount of my headspace on a of daily course. basis and has for quite a while. So. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something I, you know, I, again, I ha have, incredible respect for those people who say, Nope, I'm a musician. That's who I am. I may not make tech money, but I have to do this because it's who I am and stick with it and figure out a way to create a living for themselves. It's yeah. really, I think, I think you, I think to, to sum it up, to give it a, a nice little package, it's, you talked about going from blissful ignorance to being a jaded vet. I think that's what you just described, but yeah. no, but it's more than that, obviously. Yeah. Well, you know, the jaded thing is I think as a musician, it's hard because you, you know, you don't get paid what you're worth often, even if you Never. insist on it. Right. Uh, Rarely. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, but it is what you know, intrinsically makes you happy and brings other people such happiness. And so you, you are always holding that jaded temptation up to the light. Well, it hopefully how musicians are treated. Well, and most of the good ones that I know, yeah, you yeah. know, they're like, listen, at the end of the day, 
I don't have to crawl, you know, around on the ground to make a living. You know, I get to do something that truly gives my life meaning and happiness and gives back as much. And, and I would say of the pro musicians that I know, even though, you know, the ones in the area that they, they would make that trade 99 times out of a hundred, they would, right. they would choose to follow music you know, right. rather than anything else that might be. And, and they're not bitter about it. I mean, they just like, no, it's, it's, day, it's a choice. I'm ahead of the game. Yeah. It's a choice. Right. I'm ahead of the game. No, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's remembering that blissful ignorance, right. Is the, is sort of the full circle of that. Like, okay. Yep. I've learned, I, I, I've learned to be uh, selective and articulate and all of that stuff, but also let's not forget that I do this because I enjoy it and other, and other people enjoy it. And I enjoy the fact that other people enjoy it too. Right. Like that whole thing you need to, you need to keep it all in the mix. Yeah. Uh, while still being a pro and still catering to whatever voices are inside you that encourage you to do it right. And to be, you know, to continually improve your craft. And I, th I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's good, man. Yeah. That's what we do on this show. That's what we've been doing for almost six years. Six years. Yeah. So I had a stream on Saturday night and um, I have a gig coming up this weekend. It is reasonably socially distant. I'm, I'm six feet to 10 feet away easily from everybody. Sure. Uh, you know, some people are going to be making some choices about how their tables are closer to each other. Hopefully right. they're wearing masks and, and they're dealing with stuff. Will you be wearing a mask while you play? Mm, that's a game time decision. Yep. I played there before and I didn't. Okay. And I've thought about whether I should or not. And I don't, I don't know about you, but you know, there's feels like a fair amount of gravity just maybe in the past seven to 10 days where the caseloads are going down, the hospitalizations are going down. You're hearing more every day about people getting vaccinated. And yep. it seems like we're getting, you know, we're not at, we're not at the turning point yet, but it certainly seems like things are going in the right direction. Although I will tell you, like my pal Simon from the House Rockers, he did a, a outdoor gig at a winery this weekend, three hours. And he was like, you know, if you have a three hour gig in a year, your body will feel it. He was he was pooped at the end of the gig. And then the next the next day he was like, dude, what hit me? You know? Absolutely. No, that that was one of those things I, I said. Uh, I think I talked about it on the show early on where it was like, I don't want to find out what it's like to have to get myself back into shape. And so I've intentionally, you know, set up just things to play along with. If I don't have anything else to do, I will play at least once a week. I will play for like two hours straight. And, and it's so far it's served me well. I mean, I, you know, I had tech week for that theater show oh, what a week, a week ago. And then yesterday was a two gig day where we did, um, the way the the way the shows are running now, we're we're in uh, they call it in rep, but it's really in rotation. They're doing three different shows at the same time, so they do six shows a week. Thursday and Friday is one show, and then Saturday afternoon and evening is another show, and then Sunday afternoon and evening is is the third show. So yet our slot in the rotation for next to normal this week was was yesterday Sunday, and. Um, it was a, it, well, it was an eventful day, Paul. I, um, not only did I have to play the show twice and it was the first time in eight days since we had played it, which was interesting. We all kind of came in with, you know, high alert. Um, last song of the first act playing along, doing my thing. And suddenly mm, no response from the kick pedal relatively dark in the pit. So especially down low. So I couldn't see what was going on, but it was obvious I, whatever I did with my foot was not going to make sound out of the bass drum. So we finished the song. I grabbed a light and shined it and I had broken my bass drum pedal. So, uh, thankfully that was the end of the act. I'm like, okay, great. I think I have a patch kit in my car, which of course I did. And cause you know, ever the boy scout and, uh, and I brought it down and we patched it up and I also brought a roll of duct tape because, mm. you know, <laughs> you never know. And it's uh, because it's duct tape. And then, and I felt pretty good about it. I was like, yeah, okay. This, I have these, they're like these Kevlar patches that, that you can put on a, a bass drum. A lot of people will put them on the head to protect the, where the beater hits. It, it also changes the sound. It gives it a clickier sound uh, than you would normally get out of the head. So 
Uh, but I, it, so I put one of these on and okay, great. But it was a little smaller than, than the ones that I normally use, but that's what I had. So I put that on and in the middle of the first song of the second act, same thing. Oh, and now I look down and it's like, it's really ripped. Like this is a problem. So duct tape to the rescue. I, um, I had warned the cast too. I told him, I'm like, Hey, at, at set break, I leaned into the dressing room and I'm like, uh, what happened was, and, and it might happen again. So be, you know, be on the, be alert. We we we're, we're working on it. And they were like, okay, cool. Thanks for letting us know. And, um, and so, uh, after it happened again, I have, you know, there's breaks in the show. It's, it's based, it's almost an opera in so much as the music never really stops. There's not like long, long scenes of just dialogue or anything. And, um, but thankfully there are many parts where there are no drums or the drums are light. Uh, so I, I was able to pick my moments and I made, I'll put it as the image in the, the show notes for today. <laughs> I made a duct tape masterpiece of my bass drum uh, head such that basically all I was doing was playing a head of duct tape. Um, it got a little mushy by the end of the first of, of the second act, but it was, you know, enough to make it through. And then between shows, I ran home and grabbed a spare head and put that on and things were Being fine. MacGyver is part of the deal. I it's mean, part of the deal. That's exactly right. You, yeah. Yeah. Game time stuff, every, man. Yeah. Every, every musician has got to have ways if, if stuff fails. You're crazy prepared though. You bring an extra snare and you know, you bring a lot of extra, don't you? Well, yeah, because I've been there. Well, the, the extra snare is as much for a safety net as it is for the sound in the room. Uh, different rooms, you know, have, have different resonances and different drums, just like different guitar tones and things like you can't just, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't want to say you can't. I don't think it's a good idea if you're a guitar player to get your settings all perfect in your bedroom and then get to a gig and be like, yep, that's what I'm going to use. Cause your bedroom yeah. sounds different than a, than, you know, than the acoustics of a hall. And the same is very true about anything and including snare drums, snare drums more so than like bass drums and toms. Although those, especially toms can, can really be different, you know, in, in different rooms, but it's not so easy to carry, you know, three spare kits with you to test out the room, but it is easy to carry a couple of snare drums. And so, both as a backup, as well as just having, you know, the option of like, oh, in this room, no, 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 that's the wrong drum. Um, but I carry a spare kick pedal for emergencies because that would, it, they're very difficult to fix on the fly when one, right. you know, when one bails on you. So uh, it doesn't happen often, but, you know, like I said, those, those two things, the snare and the kick pedal are pretty small items in terms of being able to always have in your car at the ready. Be so for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it was interesting playing it, the hardest. I think I talked last week. I know I talked last week about the, the, the hardest song in the show or the most intricate song in the show, which opens the second act. And it was halfway through that, that my, my kick head broke again. So it was like, not only am I playing this crazy piece of music, but now I've got to think about how to drive this without a bass drum. And so it was like, well, let's change the grooves and make them more, you know, Tom oriented and all of that stuff. <laughs> So it was like, good thing I, I memorized it because I could think more about how I was going to play it, not what I was going to play. So, yeah, it was fun. But, you know, that, I love the, I like that's part of what I love about live music is that you have to deal with. It's in the moment. It's in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's hey, fun. I wanted to tell you about some gear that's kind of floating around. So our buddy Dan Ray. Yep. Over at uh, Cover Band Confidential. Yes. He's been talking about something that he has on order for a while that I started to check out. So I've been more fascinated with going ampless lately, mm -hmm. thinking about this. And this little Spark practice amp that I told you, you know, we started talking about around Christmas time that has all this modeling technology in it has really been interesting because of how great it sounds at really low volumes, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I've always been like, you got to push some air in order to really feel things. You know, and the early kind of modeling technology just felt plasticky to me, just didn't, didn't feel real. But sure. it seems to be getting better and better and better. Anyway, Line 6 has been iterating on modeling technology. There's a company called Headrush that has a modeling pedal board that's very popular. Um, Kemper has been another technology that um, 
that can listen to um, things that you have and model it for you on the spot. So, you know, it has the ability to do that. And now there's this new product that's coming out called the Neural DSP Quad Cortex, which is supposed to be the state of the art. And um, interestingly, is that the one they were ranting about that that is supposed to be coming out, but hasn't in in a long time and it keeps getting kicked down the road or is that a different? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think it started as, as a, you know, uh, you know, pre pre prepay for it and Kickstarter kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I mean, yes, people are frustrated that they haven't gotten it, but they're really excited about the technology. Um, and line six actually just came out with another iteration of their, of their modeling board, something that is, it fills out their product line, but I'm actually getting kind of interested in this. And you just made the comment about, you know, what you do in your bedroom is different than what you do in the venue. Yeah. But now this is a really interesting thing about what you do in your modeler in your bedroom. I mean, there's still some EQ tweaking for the room once the air gets pushed, but there, you know, you can get pretty close, I think, in, in terms of the tones that you want to put out when it's only going to be coming out of the monitors or your in-ears and the mains, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I mean, I, I think because I've, I've dealt with this both in terms w- with with success and with failure with these modelers because it's they are relatively set in stone, right? Like when you get these tones together, but you have to think about the general EQ of the room. And it it really is up to the player to get there and be like, okay, I have to roll off the low end. Or if, if you can, if you're doing it in a way that you can leave it up to your front of house or your monitor engineer or both, then it can work out. Okay. Too. Right. Like they can say, Oh, today I got to roll off you know, the low end yeah. or it needs more low end today or what, you know, whatever, but that well, it really does do that though. It really puts off the room tuning, not to you and the amp. Cause you're not pushing the air. Correct. You're, you're giving it to the front of house guy. Yeah. But, but if you're the front of house, like, I think, I think it's irresponsible of a guitar player or any of us musicians to just say, well, I'm going to show up with whatever crap sound I have and let you fix it. I, I and like really, no, really. I, and I see people do this all the time and it drives me crazy as you might be able to tell it. You have to take some responsibility for what your instrument is going to sound like in the room that you're playing. And yes, it's a partnership with the sound engineer, but it's, you know, it's not just like take whatever crap I've got and fix it. It's like, let's yeah. talk about this. You know, if it if it makes sense for me to roll some of the highs off of my sound so that it makes your job easier, well, that's how that should go. Because the goal is a good sounding show and a good show, right? Yeah. And and so, like, I you, you can't just punt on that. I don't think so. You know, that's Fair. just my opinion. I will say that one of the things that I, you know, tuners are cheap and plentiful. You can buy headstock tuners for ten bucks now, sure. and there's pedal board tuners and tuner technology comes in several kinds of pedals now. So tuners are everywhere. I still wish there were standardization in wireless technology. So I could buy a head rush or a, or a neural DSP and it would have wireless receiver. Right. Yep. And it should be like ethernet. It should be like, you know, Wi-Fi. It should be standard plug and play and not so much of a gold rush for, you know, different technologies. I yes. It just seems like, it's an extra thing on the floor, an extra thing to break, an extra manufacturer. I just think that that, like a tuner, wireless reception for your guitar or your microphone um, should be standardized and you know made to be built into a lot of the things. Get the money from licensing. Let 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 Head Rush and Line Six, you know, sell the the hardware, but you know someone else come up with a standard and let it be licensed. Well, we have standards for this, right? Like, I mean, we have, there's Wi-Fi, which we've talked about. It has high power requirements, but, but solves a lot of problems, but there's also UHF, right? And that's completely open spectrum and like works really well. You just have to make sure that you're not using the same frequencies as other people. And that the same is true with Wi-Fi. That's not an automatic thing. Anybody who lives in an apartment complex already knows that like you could have the best Wi-Fi system on the planet. If you don't set the channels, right. You it's going to be terrible. If you're competing with your neighbors, ideally, if you live in an apartment, 
you would have a monthly meeting of all your neighbors, you know, like when you, when you get the, 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 whatever it is, the building meeting together and you'd assign channels to each person that would solve all those problems. But a lot of times that's not how it works in yeah. apartments. So, but the same thing is true on stage. You've got to have, you know, no matter which tech you're using, you've got to make sure everybody's on a different frequency. And that's just how it goes. That's just I physics. Agree. Yeah. I just wish the music industry would agree. Batteries are not your friend and cables are not your friend. I don't, yeah, I, I, I mean, so I, I disagree with, with, with the, but the problem is both of those things operate against each other, right? I agree. Batteries are not your friend. However, without, if you're going to not use cables, you have to have batteries, mm. right? I mean, right. Like that's how it works, which is why oh, less, as, right? as, yeah, as a drummer, I, I have no reason to use wireless in-ears. I'm much better off using wired in-ears. I don't go far enough from my kit that having a wire is a problem. And now I don't have to worry about batteries. I don't have to worry about, you know, all of that extra tech. I don't have to worry about wireless interference. So uh, I'm not, it, wires are definitely my friend as a, as a drummer. And if you're using a, a wire on your guitar, why couldn't you just rig up the same cable or a braided cable that brought the wire for your in-ears with you? And now you've, you know, now you're good to go. I don't know. It's like, I, I think physics is a thing. You can't like, we, we don't get, a, we don't get to in our timeline anyway, <laughs> maybe in a parallel universe we can. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I, wireless is interesting. It's not, it's not panacea though. Right. It's cause it's, I mean, do you have a, do you use a wireless rig for your, for your guitar? I do. I've, and I've been to a few different ones yep. and you know, Again, I think wireless is a utility and it should just be built into something else. Like I buy, I buy pedal boards now, many pedal boards. I actually have a pedal board that the pedal board itself has a battery and you can charge the pedal board and the pedal board charges every pedal that's on it. Right. So it's, it's less, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Right. I guess what I'm saying about disposable stuff like batteries and cluttered stages from cables are problems that should be solved by now. With disposable batteries. You're saying, yeah, I, I get that. Yeah. 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 So you have some kind of rechargeable still scenario. Got power stuff. So I'm yeah, not yeah, saying that yeah, things yeah, yeah. shouldn't be not powered, but I'm saying, you know, it's just still kind of, it's messy. And again, smaller stages, you know, harder load ins and load outs, you know, there, there, I just wish that there was more, it, the music music industry doesn't seem to take the same approach as the tech industry. Again, standards are you know they, they still fight kind of proprietary wars in many ways, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 It, standard is st standardization is one of those weird things. It it can be. It's got if it's the wrong thing. The customer. What's that? They, it happens in the tech industry because it's good for the customer. As long as it's, but it it usually goes through a pretty. Uh, robust mm -hmm. vetting process sure. to, to make sure that we're picking the right standards and, and all of that. Right. I mean, like Wi-Fi is great because there is the Wi-Fi standard. Well, there's many Wi-Fi standards and you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, in incorporate any one or multiples in your device. And now, you know, you can say, okay, I've got Wi-Fi six. Great. That's compatible with your Wi-Fi six. We're good to go. That That's great. Um, I don't know that there's enough, I, I think the problem is that every scenario that we're talking about here in terms of music is a very nuanced scenario, right? Like standards are great, but my apartment building example, if everybody used not just the same standard, but the same brand of gear, it might start getting easier if that brand was built for apartments. Like you don't want to get so specific with a standard that it's limiting, but at the same time, the problems that you're looking to solve are extremely specific to like your scenario with your band and your band mates that I don't know that like a tech type standard would solve this. Mm. It's a tough problem to, to say, here's what we're going to do universally. Uh, because there's not enough, there's not enough of a market in the music industry to have everybody on the same thing with every different kind of instrument. I don't know. It's just that that's a that's an interesting. 
I think there's probably a very, I think we're stumbling on to why there's a very good reason that there's not standards for this stuff. I mean, but there are standards for this stuff. It's just perhaps not as specific as you, you want, you want plug and play where you don't have to think about it. If that's yep. what I'm hearing. Right. Yep. And in the tech industry, that's not what standards do for people. If, if it were, there would be no such thing as tech support. And I think that's, that's where the problem is. Deeper, longer conversation. Exactly. But I will say for like, I wish that the idea of, you know, you talked about smaller stages and, and tight fits and all that stuff. I wish that the internal miking systems for drums was more common. And I, and every engineer I've encountered has said the same thing. And in the kick drum that I usually use for gigs, I have an internal, it was this one company made it, the Randall May International. They made the May internal miking system. I don't know if they still do. They might. It looks like maybe they still do. Uh, but I had a my I had a AKG D112 built inside my kick drum, and it's awesome because I get on a stage and I have an XLR jack on the side of the kick, and we plug a cable into that, and we're done. Yep. And nobody's Sense. kicking over the microphone. Yep. Nobody's you, you know it's it's always in exactly the right spot. You don't have to worry about setting it up, and the tight stage doesn't matter because you don't need the room for it. And it works for a bass drum. It doesn't work for other drums because they were making them for other drums, but I, it didn't sound good having a microphone inside a snare drum. Whereas a bass drum, that's generally where, especially on like a rock stage, uh, the mic will go anyway. So why yeah. not just leave it in there? Of course, the problem is if I use a different drum, I got to buy a second microphone. <laughs> so, so there's that, but yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. It's fun. Uh, it's fun stuff, but yeah, it, 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 what's that? Dreaming up the future. Dreaming up the future. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the future, listener Gideon sent us a note not long ago uh, telling us that he recorded a version of Rush's Tom Sawyer. He's a drummer and he did a drum cover of this. And, uh, and so I thought, oh, let me, you know, let me look. And, and his article where he had this, which I'll link in the show notes for all of us. Uh, the article where he had this was it detailed some of the the gear that he used and how he went about recording this. But what I noticed was how great his video looked. And he talks about tuning drums and other things. I mean, it's a it's a great piece. Very, very much like go check this out, especially if you're a drummer. But really, if you're anybody that's that's around drummers, you know, there's there's a lot of great tips in here in his piece. But I noticed, wow, like this video looks great and it's clear he did it all himself. So how did you do it? And he was kind enough to send us even more information. So um, he I would say he basically is doing, you know, lights, camera and editing on a budget is is really what he has put together here. Uh, the he starts with a Lumix D7, which is a budget DSLR video camera but it's still going to run you like 500 plus. So of all the quote unquote budget things, that's per perhaps the one that sits outside of the budget. You could do this with your iPhone, uh, by the way, it, the, the camera's not quite as good, obviously, but, uh, but you know, there you go. So if you of course your iPhone costs more than the, the $600 camera. So maybe, maybe budget is the right word. Uh, but then the rest of it was uh, other pieces of hardware and software to pull it all together, which really he was able to do on a budget. He's got this softbox lighting kit that he sent us. It's a, it's a pair of lights for 70 bucks and they are built to, to light for professional photography and video studios, but they're 70 bucks for the pair of them. And you can even carry them around. They come in like a little case. So, so there's those, and we've got links for all this in the show notes. And then he uses DaVinci resolve as his video editor of choice. He brings in all the stuff into that. And uh, Da Vinci, I don't, if, if you folks, I think we've talked about it on the show before here, Paul, it's a fantastic piece of software. It is a true pro editing video, video editing piece of software that is available for free unless you need some very specific features. And they, they drew the line in what I think is the perfect spot, because if you are a pro video editor doing this for a living, you would need the features that you would have to pay. I don't think it's very much like, I mean, in that realm, I don't think it's very much like 300 bucks or 400 bucks, maybe for, right? But if you don't need those features because you're not a pro, everything else is available for free. 
So it's a brilliant spot that they've sort of sat resolve into here. Uh, so he uses resolve, which he uses for free, but I noticed this video looked really, really nice. And he's like, Oh, right. I use these free LUTs for DaVinci resolve. And I said, well, what's an LUT? <laughs> and he says, it's a lookup table. So the idea, and he sent us a link for 35 of these that are free. The idea of a lookup table is it's essentially a color. I'm going to get this wrong. Cause I'm not a pro. Uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You can yell at us, but also tell us how to say this right. Uh, and maybe you understand, Paul. The idea behind a lookup table is, or an LUT, as 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 the pros call it, uh, it it allows you to sort of um, tune your video's color to be to to look more produced. That that if you look at a great example is if you look at say live sports right on TV. And then you go watch a movie, the movie, the live sports are going to look like raw and edgy, like they're supposed to. And the wow. movie is going to look smooth and rounded and, yeah. you know, and a little bit darker, maybe, but whatever that movie's supposed to be. Some movies are like super vibrant. It's because they're putting the whole thing through either a lookup table or probably it with movies, you know, a series of them. And I'm, I'm guessing live sports is also put through these. It's just meant to look more live, like less processed even though right. it's probably massively processed. Uh, and so he found, you know, he experimented with some of these lookup tables and found the ones that he liked that gave him the look that he was going for. Now you could do all of this on your own by tweaking brightness and contrast and color replacement and all that stuff. Or you could start with one of these lookup tables where somebody else has done all the work for you. And then you can They're just presets. tweak their presets. Thank you, Paul. Yes. That's <laughs> the word I'm looking for. You crystallize my thoughts perfectly. So Yeah. So, um, so I put all of these links in the show notes from Gideon's note here, including his original article, which, uh, again, I think is fantastic. So he did a good job writing. I'm actually, I'm looking at it now and yeah, it, it, he's really well laid out. It's a great resource. Well thought through. Yeah. Yeah, for good, sure. Good, good job. Yep. Yeah. And thanks Thank for sending it in. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Cool. Um, you want to talk about in the last episode, Paul, we talked about recalling lyrics uh, and just memorizing things in general on stage and listener Adam sent in a note. Can we, uh, can we, can we dig into yeah, this? I think it's a great topic. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's about set lists and recording, re remembering lyrics and, you know, little, little hints that can get you through the day. Absolutely. Yeah. So he says, I listened to your last episode and wanted to share a tidbit about recalling lyrics. I find most of the time, if you have familiarity with the song, the first word or two of the verse will trigger the rest. So what I started doing with any new tunes where the lyrics haven't yet been solidified in my head is that I use the blank part of the paper on the right of our set list to simply jot down a few words that I know will spark recall. For example, you mentioned come together last week, Paul, and he said, that's a perfect one. He says, since there are four verses to the right of that song, I'd put keywords like flat top. Shoe shine, bag production, roller coaster, just so I can take one glance down at my set list paper before each verse, and that will trigger the rest of the lyrics, hopefully. Uh, but I'm not staring at a screen for every word, which makes good sense. Yeah. Um, he says, so I, I have a lot ahead. of thoughts about this. Yeah. And let me just say, I still think that once your brain knows it's, it's in your pad, you still will battle that, right? Yeah, of course. You, you, yeah. So I, I, that may be an inhibitor to taking advantage of this cheat, but the concept is really, really smart. And it's also a good concept to learning lyrics. I think, you know, what you might want to do is just pick a key word, like see, you know, you go through it, you listen, you've listened to the song 10, 20, 50 times, and you have some ability that your brain sucks it in. And then for whatever reason, you can't remember one line in a certain verse or something like that. Sometimes one word is all that you need. So adding that to your, your set list, if you're the singer, I think is a really, really smart idea. And it's something that that is a better crutch than having a pad in front of you. Well, it's Again. the half crutch, right? It's because it's not giving you everything. And so yeah. you're forced it's making you work for it. Yeah, right. Yep. You're there were other things in that in that email that I thought were really, really remarkable. So I, I agree. You uh, you want me to keep going here? Yeah, go for it. He says, uh, says I don't notice many other bands using the set list paper beyond just a listing of song names, and there are other great, helpful things that you can include on there, such as if it's a tune where we will open it up to improvisation, 
Uh, he says, I find that it's helpful to include instrument emojis in the order I'd like the jam to unfold. He says, so for example, superstition. And then he puts, you know, the little guitar emoji, the keyboard emoji, the sax emoji, the drum emoji. He says, helps all band members understand who solos next so we can avoid the dreaded two to four bars of awkward vamping after the band leader gives a nod to someone on stage and they're caught off guard. Yeah, absolutely. I call that the baton rolling around on the stage. Somebody's got to hold the baton and run with it at all times. He says, I also include the key of the song. So there's no question. And the desired BPM for the drummers, so they have a target to aim at or whoever starts it. And speaking of who starts it, I put a th the same kind of thing, the, the emoji of who starts, of the instrument that starts the song right on the set list. And that way you can look quick and be like, all right, great, guitar starts this one. I'm not, I don't have a guitar in my hand. It's not up to me. Right. Like, Free, yeah. yeah. And, and which is ha like super handy. I think this is, it's really smart. The use of emojis. And he sent us a picture of his set list, which hopefully he'll post in uh, our Facebook group so we can all see this. But, um, so please do that, Adam, if you would. I thought the use of emojis on a set list is brilliant. If you ask me, especially if you got a color. So let me ask you as a, uh, as a drummer, a question. Um, do you, Mark up your set list with BPMs. If it if if you guys don't typically put that in a printed set list, um, I will for certain songs. If it's a song that is new or something, you know, especially like prepping a madhouse kind of thing, I will put BPMs in. Yeah, All right, that's sometimes. interesting. Yeah. So to me, when I started with the band again, you know, I'm going to go back to this concept of this continuum of what makes sense to me as an amateur versus what makes sense to me as a as a more working guy. But I would be like, why on earth would you need key? You know, we've practiced the song 500 times. You don't know what, key, how do you not remember what key it is? That's like, remember what chords it is. But I, it is interesting that guys in my band who play in many other groups that do different versions of the same song, yep. um, you know, that, that is helpful, right? You know, to put them in the key. And I guess the, for a drummer, the beats per minute would be a similar type of a cue. You may play the song in another band that prefers it faster or, you know, whatever. So I can see how it is. The emojis, you know, we don't do a lot of open jams, but I could see using the emojis as to a reminder as to who is the soloist in the song. Who yeah. The solo. But again, right. we've played, our band has played these songs 500 times. I, you know, I would think these th uh, things would happen. Um, the that's your band, right? I mean, like th yeah, this guy's yep. band might be organized completely differently, right? You're, you've got 10 people on stage, so you can't afford to have as much looseness in the flow of the songs, uh -huh. right? Like as, as a, as a three piece yes, band, a pickup might, band, right? Yeah. It's a, yeah, exactly. Well, not even a pickup band, like a three piece band might have a lot more flexibility because they, it's only got to get three minds to meld, not 10 minds. Fair to enough. Meld, right. Yeah. yeah fair yeah. enough. Um, one of the things that he showed in his set list is that he put some kind of inspirational phrase at the bottom of the set list. And that just kind of blew my mind. And, and it took me into thinking about a few different things. You know, do any of your bands do a pre-show hug, prayer, holding hands, anything like that? Um, it depends on the, on the band and the gig fling we'll do some sort of like, all right, let's, let's, let's sync up with each other. We might sing a chorus of something to get, you know, in sync that way. It doesn't happen at every gig because it just can't, but if yeah. the, but yeah, if the, if it's there, yeah, a absolutely. I, I've, well, I've cool. done that. Yeah. Not we, we've flirted with this with the house rockers over the years, but it's often an awkward thing, right? Correct. It's an awkward, you know, there's a little bit of, jaded pro musician guys who like, let's just, let's just play, you know, there's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of like just the human, you know, feeling I'm, you know, I, I'm really into that. And, and the motivation to get guys playing for a, a cause of, you know, making people happy with music. I think they all feel that intrinsically, but as a leader of band, I feel some deep seated need to feel that with my bandmates that we're all kind of going out on this journey together. Yep. And I just was thinking that what an interesting way to do it to like put something inspirational at the bottom of a set list, like, you know, let's kill it tonight. Or, you know, we almost had this taken away from us, you know, or something yeah. every night. And I would bet that, you know, that's something that doesn't require a lot of human interaction skills. And I bet the guys would get a kick out of it. And I bet they would start to look forward to it. I mean, even, you know, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, morose or that overly deep every night, just something 
that is almost like a private message to you and your bandmate because no one's it. supposed to see that set list. That's right. I just really that that blew me away when Adam showed his list, and I thought that was really cool. I yeah, I like that idea. I've never done that on a set list before, but I I I had the same thought. Like, oh, I'm definitely going to start doing this on set list. Yeah, I liked it. Like, well, yeah, that it's just of- like you said. It's just it's that it's that private thought that can tie you all together. And not only do you see it when you get the set list to, you know, put at your feet or wherever you're going to have it at the gig, but you see it throughout the night too. It's like, Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. And it is a little way for the band leader or the set list maker. Yeah. That's like a, that's a great bonding technique. It's like, this is a little hidden message that only we're seeing. Yep. That is, you know, and if you do it, you can make it a joke one night. You can, you know, you can make it a happy birthday wish, I suppose, or something Absolutely. like that, or whatever yeah. it is. But it just seems like a really interesting, smart thing to do on a set list. So he also now, puts his URL of- on the set list, so it's maybe not just for uh, for the band to uh, see, right? Like he's <laughs> in case somebody picks up a set list. At the of, end of the course, night and yeah. and he does something that I love doing. He creates, I, I call it the back pocket on our set list. He calls it the bullpen on his. So he's yeah, got, that's it what was, we call it. yeah, it was a one set gig for him. He's got 17 songs on the, uh, on this particular list. And then there's another six of them in the bullpen songs that he can call anytime everybody's ready for. And all the other things are there. Who's doing the intro, what the key is, or even the chord progression of the tune, the BPM, all that stuff sitting in the bullpen. And, and he does something that, that I've found helpful. He makes it in a slightly smaller font so that mm-hmm. it's not distracting you all night long. You're not seeing it in the list of everything. You're not confused by it. But yet he's got it right there. So he can be like, all right, now it's time for Boogie Shoes. Let's go. And everybody's got what they need. There's no That's questions. That's so smart. Yep. When we started, you know, my, my horns read, right? So they sure. you know, have music books in front of them. And, you know, over time, they it's moved to a pad. But when we started, we needed to find a way to quickly get the horns from from chart to chart. So once we got up to, you know, a couple hundred songs, them reordering their book in set list order every night was getting to be pretty cumbersome. Uh, we, we had them do it alphabetically. We used to number the charts and, you know, I'd call it by the number. Um, and But now it's gotten so much easier that they've all gone to pads and they're just two taps away from any song, which is kind of cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the set list is a is an interesting and mystical thing, right? It is it is your, ro- your band's roadmap for the night, but it is an opportunity, you know, to make the musician's life easier. And now as an opportunity to communicate anything, like, you know, remember it's Angie's birthday tonight or, you know. The- right all those types of things that is the kind of critical information that a band needs to have. And if you want to make it motivational, it can kind of be like that, that band, you know, all hands in type of thing before you take the stage. It can also help with that type of thing. I agree. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, th- there's so many things. I Again, Adam, if you would uh, either, you know, give us permission. I don't want to post this without your permission, but feel free to just post it at uh, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. And we'd thanks for to, the note, too. Yeah, I mean, we'd love it was to really, see it there. really useful. We, we've been getting good stuff. I mean, Gideon stuff and Adam stuff. We, we were getting really useful, you know, tips from around the world of what people do to, you know, make their craft ever better. I love it. That's great, man. That's, I love it. So good. For sure. So good. All right. Well, that's what uh, that's what I got for today. You got anything else, Paul? No, this is fun. Little, little. It does seem like the world is starting to open up. The outdoor space stuff is now starting to seem there. Every day, I see more messages about people getting vaccinated and you know yeah. feeling really good about getting vaccinated. And uh, it just seems like we're all going to go on a path now. And you know, if you do outdoor gigs or if you live in a place where there can be, you know, obviously in California, sure, you know, I'd say start get your ducks in a row because it's there's there's immense interest and gravity to get this going as fast as possible. So, you know, whereas in the beginning of the year, I thought maybe by the spring and then it was pretty clear that with the vaccine rollout and all stuff, it might not be till the fall. And now it seems like it's inching earlier for mass gatherings might be August, you know? Yeah. Yeah, There's more I, information I, I, coming out every day, but you know that everybody yeah. wants the world to get back open again. Right. Yeah. I think I, it'll be interesting to see when, when we're comfortable. And I, I, you know, I, we keep saying 
as we talk about this, I think it's going to be a, a tiered rollout, if you will, or a tiered expansion. You know, I, I don't think we're going to go from zero to stadiums being filled with people, but I think we're going to go from, you know, from zero to small clubs being filled with people to, you know, 500 person clubs to thousand person clubs. Right. You know, and so, um, but yeah, why not book the gigs? I, and, and, in your, if you're someone who likes to go see music on your, on the leisure side of things, why not book, you know, concert tickets? If, if the show's postponed, you get your money back or, you know, you get res- it'll get rescheduled. Right. But, um, but you know, we, we booked some, some tickets for some shows this summer, just this weekend. And it was like, yeah, like we probably won't, these probably won't happen, but it sure feels nice to be booking tickets and like planning a trip like that. Um, yeah. And in, if it gets rescheduled, that's fine. You know, like there's nothing we can do about that. So let's see what happens. And maybe we get to go and maybe we don't. We'll find out. So, yep. Stay safe, everybody. Have fun out there. Yeah. It's, um, it's good. It's good. And, uh, always be performing, especially when you're performing, but even the rest of the time. Have a good week, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com.